All right. Three, two, one. My ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. Welcome to 82 Points of View with Dorian. I'm your host, Dorian. Um, today with, so this is probably a year, year and a half ago. One of my clients was one of my clients, somebody who we were helping at Group A to music, like an artist. He was looking for photographers and he was in Indianapolis. He's like, do you, do you know anybody? I was like, I mean, I know a few people, but everybody knows lazy. And so I was looking through, I don't know how I found, but I came across this person who we have today. And I was looking, I was like, yo, her stuff is really, really good. So I hit her, I was like, yo, do you edit all your own photos? And she said, yeah. And she said she took her own photos and edited her own photos and woo woo And something happened with that artist where we could never connect with him and get him because something happened. He was bullshitting. But I started following her and I started looking. I was like, oh, not only does she edit her own photos and she takes her own photos, like she takes photos for the NBA. I was like, yo, she's really, really talented. And I was looking, I was like, yo, why is this not connecting on social media? I was like, okay, let's try to get her on the podcast for she blows up because it's a matter of time because she does a really good job. So from my hometown today, we have photo NBA photographer, Mrs. <laughs> Pepper Robinson. How are you? I am well. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So the first question we ask everybody is, what is the worst job you've ever had? I worked at Panera Bread. <laughs> it was the worst job. I will never work in food again. Never. Which which, which one? Uh, Panera Bread in like Castleton area. Oh, hell no. That's the worst one. <laughs> oh, God, stop busy in there. Oh, it was like the I will never work in food. I rarely will ever eat Panera bread. Like, no. Was this in high school? Yeah, it was my first job. So when I was in high school, I wasn't allowed to have a job until um basketball season ended my senior year. Mm -hmm. And so it was my first job. And everyone's like, oh, it's an easy job. They hire everybody. I was like, okay, sounds good. Like, I want to make money. <laughs> they did not tell me what I would be doing. I had no idea. I'd be cleaning bathrooms, picking yeah. up people's food, and yeah. they were rude. Yes. Yeah. Panera, too, um, that's like a kind of a, I don't want to say a bougie clientele, but it's not like it's McDonald's. The who, they, it's the people who think they're doing something because it's not McDonald's. It's yeah. not like whatever. It's still fast food. Like yeah. it's still quick. It's just because it's a sit down place. They think it's cool. I can imagine, too, like, Seeing that soup every day, that should have made me throw up. <laughs> I don't even, it's not, you know, it's fresh ish. <laughs> fresh ish. <laughs> Hell no. Nah. I feel like everybody's had to work at fast food at one time. My first, like, real, real job, I worked at Arby's. It was off of um, 86 and side, no, 70. Wow, such a long time ago. It was off Zionville. So he was 71st in Zionsville or 86 in Zionsville. I, I can't oh. remember. And so like <laughs> it was, yeah, that that shit. When when you work in fast food, man, it, it makes you not ever want to eat there again because you see everything that goes yeah. on, like people dropping chicken fingers on the floor, putting them in the fryer anyway. Like it's just all types of shit. It's like, yo, you know what? I'm I'm never, ever, ever gonna do this again. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, it also made me really respect like actual waiters and waitresses because if I'm just taking your order and you're mad at me, then I can't imagine what it's like, you know, having to carry someone's food out and stuff like that. It made me appreciate it so much more. I think that's something with the with our generation because like I know my mom or my dad or even like like my grandparents like they'll get upset at like waiters or waitresses especially when they try to customize the order like at Panera like yo you don't customize orders at Panera just order the shit that's on the goddamn menu but like <laughs> they don't they don't think like that and I think be, because of our generation because I guess probably a lot of us have had these jobs we're like yo I'm not about to make this dude's life hard or make her life hard like she makes eight dollars an hour like she doesn't give a damn yeah definitely and like yeah it's who like i just remember like there's this lady she like wanted literally nothing else on the sandwich plus something else and i was like so flustered i was like okay like and i don't like it's not like a simple system or something mm -hmm. where you just click an ad it's like 10 different screens and it's five people behind them and yeah, so a, a very big appreciation. And yes, I definitely have witnessed parents getting upset with waiters before my lifetime. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you're you're from Nap. So were you born in Nap too? Yes, yes, I was born and raised. 
So born and raised on, on what side of town? Um, Northeast, like Lawrence North area. Okay. okay. All right. That ain't that bad. Um, so <laughs> for those of you that are from Indianapolis, um, Indianapolis is, I think we're like the 16th largest city. So we're like a big city or we're not. Um, everybody knows everybody. And then where you are raised in certain areas basically determines the type of person that you are and what you're used to. So I was raised in like the Northwest area. So I went to North Central and Northeast, like Lawrence North and all that area, Lawrence Central, like that's right next to us. But then you got like the far East side, which I got love for, you know, I, mean? I got people over there, but different environment, far West side, different environment, like down South, North, yep. Normal, Fishers, different. So we were basically neighbors. Um, and then, so you got siblings too, right? Yes. Um, I have an older brother, an older sister, a younger brother and a bonus sister. So, so you're like, are you the middle child or are you, what's your, so my two older siblings are like way older, like 30 plus. Okay. And then it's me. And then my youngest brother is 19. Okay. My sister's about to turn 18. So I'm kind of in the middle. Like my older sister was kind of home more than my older brother, but so you're I'd the mid middle. So you're the middle child to th so it's almost like to them you're like the baby, and then mm -hmm. to the ones below you're like the yeah. Uh, big okay, yeah, that's kind mm -hmm. of a unique dynamic. Cool, cool. And so what did so what did your parents do when uh, you were you were growing up? Where they work at? What they do? So uh, for the most part, my mom was a stay at home mom, but she had a job here and there, like worked for an insurance company. But my mom's like an amazing artist. Um, she does like painting. She'll draw. She'll do like she right now. She's um, building um, like a TV like stand thing, like from wood, like straight from imagination, whatever. So she does that. And then. Um, my dad owns a company called ESG Security, and he's worked there my entire life. Um, it's event services. So it actually has to do a lot with what my job is now. They do the security for the Pacers, like Bankers Life Fieldhouse. Um, where else? Like Victory Field. Hold on. Is that the company with the with the yellow shirts? Yeah. At Victory oh. Field, they got yellow shirts. Yeah. That's your dad's company? Um, it's you might it's not lucas oil if you think about the people at lucas oil that's not them it's uh, like like I'm, I'm thinking like all the events that i went to growing up like whether it was like a pacer game i feel like they would yep. be a classic i feel like they would be an expo sometimes they're everywhere icc anywhere you can imagine yeah that's my dad's company damn so. okay all right <laughs> now it all makes sense so when you were growing up so obviously y'all were going to every event for free so no actually uh people ask me that a lot and actually i get asked a lot for tickets and stuff but like i don't get them <laughs> like um people have this idea that because it's the event service and stuff that like the tickets like they would just whenever we need them but a lot of times you use those tickets to get more clients yes you I want them to see the process of going through security you want them to see and stuff like that so i never really thought to ask i felt kind of guilty asking but so, no, I really didn't. Um, I think like the biggest event I went to is when uh, the Pacers played the Heat <laughs> in the uh, Western Conference. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, damn, man, man, that's crazy. I just remember like, <laughs> like it's crazy in your hometown. There's these things that are really specific to you. That if I explain to somebody else, like here in Houston or something, they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? But like <laughs> now that like I'm, everybody back home, like, yo, I see them yellow shirts everywhere. That's crazy that that's your dad's company. So your dad was an entrepreneur then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, st he started bouncing like clubs, um, worked out like when it was called Deer Creek, which is now like, it's not clips anymore. It's something else. They but like the name every goddamn yeah. two years. Yeah. So he started out just regular and he decided to do his own thing. And so, yeah. So your dad was a bouncer and then he set up his own shop. Pretty much. Is, your dad, is your dad a big dude? Yeah. <laughs> I look, I'm a spitting image of my mother. I look absolutely nothing like my father. <laughs> did, did, your, did your dad play football or something? No, he didn't. Um, my dad um, didn't really get those opportunities growing up. He had a pretty rough um, upbringing. So, you know, he didn't really, you know, he, he works out. Yeah, He works out for sure. <laughs> He's definitely into weightlifting and stuff like that. But no, he didn't really get to do um, much organized sports. Are, you, are your parents from Indianapolis too? 
Um, well, my mom is actually from the Philippines. Okay. She came to America around like seven or eight. And then my dad is from Indiana, but like has lived like all over, like all over. Really? Mm-hmm. And then how they meet? Um, <laughs> so actually they met in my mom's parents' restaurant. Um, it was a Filipino restaurant by IPY's campus. Um, they met kind of older, I want to say like kind of late twenties and my dad, um, but my mom was like skipping high school. So my mom looks really young. My dad's like, are you supposed to be here? Like he was kind of concerned and then he just kept coming back and then he was like, let's go on a date. So, so your grandparents on your mom's side were entrepreneurs too. Yes. Wow. So you got that generation. And then your dad was a bouncer. I've I've been a bouncer. I don't know um, you a little bit behind me. I don't know if you remember the club Cloud Nine at all. No. <laughs> okay. All right. It was on 38th Street. Um, it was over there by the Value City. Used to be over there. It's over there by a skating rink. It, listen, yep. Okay. I know. I know what skating rink you're talking okay, about. Okay. It's over there by uh, Club Rio. If that's still open, I don't know if it is the strip club where the patients got in trouble. You were young when that happened. No, that was very young when that happened. But I have a general idea of what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, when I tell you that like this club was fucking rocking, like it was rocking. <laughs> like every weekend. I'm not exaggeration, Pepper. It was like a thousand people every weekend. Oh yeah, no. Like I'm... all black people. And then for some reason they had a rule like you had to dress up. So it was like sophisticated hood shit. So like <laughs> so like niggas is in there in like blue suits and shit. And like that chicken sounds like, <laughs> sounds like, like nap. <laughs> we were turning the fuck up. I was probably man, I think how old was I when I was going to cloud? I was probably like 22, 23. And like we should be and so um this was right after I left IU after the recession. It was like 2008. And so everybody couldn't, couldn't find a job. So I was like, Shh. everybody kept saying, man, you want to be a bouncer? You want to be a bouncer? I'm a big dude. I'm like, yeah, fuck it. I'll be a bouncer. They paid me like $50 a night. That um, crazy job was like one of the funnest jobs I've ever had because people, and you can probably ask your dad about this, people view you as the entertainment. And I didn't realize that, right? <laughs> like they view you like the bartenders, the waitresses, and the uh, DJ. So girls was constantly coming up to me like niggas would hand me money to get their music played by the DJ. It was actually like a pretty cool gig. But once them Brightwood Hallville niggas started fighting, I'm like, nah, I'm not breaking none of that shit up. Sorry, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so I actually have worked for my dad. Um, so I kind of have an idea. Definitely have never worked a club in my life. Um, <laughs> but when I tell you, like people will come up to you and be like, hey, uh, you you look really pretty. Do you uh do you mind uh, getting me back back there and you know like help me? I'm like no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for calling me pretty, but that does not mean you get to go to the back. Like you know what's funny though is like that shit works because obviously there's somebody over the years who has agreed to that shit and niggas is just outrageous, man, outrageous. So, but that's really cool. So that's dope that your dad started that from that position because I used to have those thoughts too like when i was a bouncer i could just do the math i'm like man they charging 20 25 30 50 dollars to, to get in um like it, it, they got the bar they got the i'm like man this he gotta be pulling in like 40 50 g's a weekend i was like damn like, i want to open my own club but that's dope that your dad really went out on his own did he ever talk about the early years of setting up his uh, event security company yeah, so there was a, it was kind of a group of him and his other friends that started it, I believe, but he is the one who obviously has lasted. Like he's now in charge of everything. Um, but no, he doesn't talk about it very much. He, um, um, he, like I hear stories here and there, but from what I understand, it was, you know, it wasn't that hard. You know, it, it, it was a need in the city. It, you know, um, especially you know after like 9 11 mm-hmm. like security was so important i mean at pacer games we got walkthroughs and metal detectors and you need to take everything out of your pockets and all of that so security you know it's it's a constant need i mean they, they're still needed now with um the pandemic going on like we still have um security guards working on the site and stuff so damn crazy and so 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 he did that and so were you into sports when you were younger or what was like what was going on as your dad was building this company what what kind of kid were was pepper so 
I definitely got lucky that I had parents that let me try everything in the world. And when I say I tried everything in the world, I mean, um, at one point I was in like singing lessons because I was sure that like I wanted to be a singer. Um, I did every sport you can imagine, lacrosse, soccer, gymnastics, tumbling, cheerleading. Um, but the one that stuck, um, well, tech is technically two, but the one that means the most is basketball. And then I also played softball in high school. So um, yeah, I was pretty active. Um, and yeah, I would say I was a pretty active kid. I feel like I always was trying to be um, in, the scene and just um yeah like I, I i would say i wanted i always wanted to kind of be something like i always wasn't just um i was never on the sidelines for sure yeah yeah so so you wanted attention you wanted everybody to know who you was in a well in a way it's kind of hard not to when your name's pepper yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> like i like i just always Kind of felt the need to do something more i could never yeah. sit on my hands yeah. there was never a point where i just did nothing and i you know like as a kid like i just i created the newspaper at my elementary school i started a fundraising thing like this is in second grade i started um a donation fund for kids who got for school like free school lunches you know they never got extras you know like the fruit roll-ups and stuff so like i started a fund so those kids could get some um, I was always doing something though. You said you played basketball. How tall are you? I'm five four. Oh, five four. You mad mad petite. Like what kind yes. of point guard were you? I was not a point guard actually. I was a shooting guard. What kind of team were you on <laughs> where you were the two? So okay. I when I was in middle school, I had a really bad middle school experience. And you know, what they don't like to talk about is you know the big catholic schools or whatever you know you would do s winter camp or summer camp with them winter camp with them right mm -hmm. and you would train with the high school girls and you would train with them at the end you would be evaluated to see if you'd be on the summer team meaning you were going to play with them next year right so i did that with one of the big catholic schools starts with a v okay <laughs> okay i got you i got you <laughs> and Fuck it, I, I say it. Fuck or buff, bro. Go ahead. Nope, nope, nope. Bishop starts. Oh, damn. Oh, they always, they've been corny for life. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so I did that, and they were, the coach basically was like, oh, yeah, you're not playing high school basketball. Like, it's just, he was like, you're just, you know, you're not big enough, whatever. And at the time that he was talking, I was 4'11. I was very petite. Like, I, I'm in my head, I was going to be a, a point guard, right? Yeah. And he was basically like, you're not going to play. And my, parents well my mom she found this high school called heron high school it's downtown yep. Yep. and they had only had a team for two years mm -hmm. and i wanted to play and i needed a new environment because i didn't like the environment that i was in and so i went there and i ended up becoming a two because it's not that i'm not coordinated obviously you have to be able to create your own shot as a two but if it's one thing that i can do it shoot the basketball so <laughs> Talk that shit. I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You know, everybody got their thing. You know, they might be strong on defense. Great ball handlers, great rebound. I was good at shooting. So. So you, a couple of things there. So you were, were you in private school your entire life? No. Okay. So like, so were you going to like Lawrence North kindergarten and elementary school? Yeah. So I was in Lawrence Township from K through fourth grade. Okay. And then in fifth grade, I went to a Catholic school. So from fifth to eighth, I went to Catholic school. It's called St. Pius. Yep. And then I finished at Heron. St. Pius is always really good at football. That's like the vicious retard feeder. You know what I mean? Um, why you why you make that face? What's that all about? <laughs> I didn't have the best middle school experience. Yeah. Um, we were all kids. So, you know, at 23, I don't really hold it against them. Um, but yeah, it was definitely not <laughs> the greatest time in my life. It, um, it, were, were people making fun of you because they thought that you were the pretty girl? Was it like your heritage? <laughs> I definitely, like I definitely um, wasn't that because I was the pretty girl. Um, you know, I think a lot of it is because I was an outsider. Um, 
you know, those kids, they, they start going to school together in kindergarten. Yes. So all that time that I had been with my friends yeah. at, you know, um, school, they had been with each other and, uh, you know, something that like, I don't think we thought about, or they even really thought about, um, back then was like, I was the only person of color in my, um, class. I think, I think there was one or two others that had come through, but I mean, you know, like then, like, this is my natural hair. Um, I wore it straight every day. Oh, wow. To fit in. Yeah. And, um, I don't think, I don't even think they knew that, but like, I wanted to be accepted so badly because, you know, <laughs> you know, I like, I didn't know them mm. and I wanted them to know me. And I thought, okay, well, if I, you know, act like them and look like them and all that stuff, like I didn't even grow up in the Catholic church. <laughs> um, and I ended up like having my first communion and doing all these things. And I don't, I'm not practicing Catholic now, but yeah. So I did a lot of things to try and be accepted by people that I, not to hold it against them. I don't think they wanted to accept me. So it's, you know, when I, so my dad was in the military and so I was born in Texas and then we moved to Japan. So from six months to four years old, I was in Japan. So I learned how to walk, talk, eat, sleep, shit on my own in a whole nother country. I was on the air force base. And then I moved to California, Northern California. <laughs> and then my parents are from Dayton, Ohio. So we moved there when I was six. And then when I was 10, we moved to Indianapolis. And then I was in Indianapolis for middle school, high school, college. So that's my hometown, Indianapolis. I got a chance to experience a lot. And some of the stuff that you've dealt with, I had to deal with. I've been to all white schools. I've been to all black schools. I've been to schools that are in the hood. I've been to schools where like nobody looks like me at all. And I had to reinvent, not reinvent myself. I had to fit in everywhere that I went. So I understand exactly what you're, what you're saying. One thing I noticed when I got to Indianapolis, like you said about those kids at St. Pius, people have been known each other since they were in kindergarten. And so I noticed that fortunately for me, I had really, really good friends that I met instantly. Like people that I met the moment that I moved to Indianapolis, I'm still friends with to this day. Right. So that, that I know that I was rare with that, but for girls, oh my God, like I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. And it's so rare that people from that get that experience. So you you're well versed in like the different social dynamics of different groups. That's that's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I definitely don't hold this against any of these people. But, you know, there was maybe like a couple people there, you know, that were nice that like, you know, I kind of keep up with here and there. But, you know, of course, it was not nice every day. <laughs> like there is plenty of very bad situations that I was in that one really shaped me as a person, but two like really taught me a lot about people and like, like what it means to like kind of be ignorant, you yeah. know, like when you have been in a bubble for so long, like you don't actually know like what goes on outside of it. Like I was going to a school where people are black, white, you know, Indian and stuff like that. Like it wasn't uncommon for me to look the way I looked. And I don't necessarily think looks had everything to do with it. Nah, it does though. It does because people <laughs> judge you based off of that, especially when it comes to girls, especially at that age. Like that's that's the first thing in in, in middle school, people are already awkward. Like everybody oh, yeah. looking or whatever. So for women especially when they attack your looks, that's the eat lowest hanging fruit. That's a big thing. Huge oh, thing. and I was, I was little, I was awkward. Like <laughs> I, oh, like, I mean, I was bait. Like I was definitely like, you know, easy target. Um, but yeah, like, it's crazy. Like I look back on like a lot of pictures of myself and I can see it in my face, like, oh my God, I look so miserable. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not smiling. Like I should be smiling. That was cute. I mean, like I definitely was, but I could just tell that because my self confidence was so low that like I wasn't um, exuding a good energy. I guess it's such a it's such a crazy thing, right? When you look at the pictures and you can see it, everybody else can't. But like you're like the clown with like the tears. Like you can like I look at my senior pictures in high school because in high school I wasn't happy, and I look at them and I'm just like. Yeah, you cute, but nigga, you yeah. not happy, yo. Like I was, I and, and I remember like the smiling pictures. It was what it was. But I remember when she said, "Okay, you need to take a serious picture." It took no effort. Like it wasn't serious. It was just like <laughs> sad. And it's the picture that my grandma got hanging up in her house. Oh no! And I'm just like, 
it's a good picture, but like, nigga, you were not happy, man. That's that's amazing, though, that you went through those experiences and you were able to like really understand and like learn from. And I know the St. Pius one, I know they're trying to slide into uh, DMs now. Uh, <laughs> Look at yeah, 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 yeah. It definitely happened. I think <laughs> the worst, the worst though, is like in high school. Cause you know, high school is when everybody like, starts to learn about boys and girls, yeah, really. Yeah. And they're like, of course I was getting called pretty, but when I was in high school, the trend was slim thick. You yeah. know, everyone loved India Love and Nicki Minaj. And I'm not built like that. So <laughs> it was always, oh, you would be so beautiful if you, and, but you, you would be the baddest girl if you had a fat ass. Yeah. Like it was always something about, then it became like my body. So when I was young, it was how I looked. When I was older, it was my body. And I had the worst experience in high school. Um, I had this guy, uh, he told all the people at school, I looked like a little kid, like without clothes on or whatever. And um, I was like ruined. Like I was like, I'm never gonna find love. None of you came right back around. Exactly. <laughs> like clockwork. Like clockwork. It's, that's why I hate school. And and anybody that's following my content, and I don't know if you start, if you'll start or whatever, like I just, I, it's just so destructive in so many ways like socially it it builds thick skin but at the same time there's a lot of stuff that you get exposed to at school that you just don't need to be exposed to and then academically i just feel like it doesn't prepare you for the real world like if you're not good at math english social studies science other shit doesn't matter like you could be the best art student ever you'll never make a career in art Right. Or even like with me, like I played instruments in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. And, and then I quit in eighth grade. And my band teacher asked, I'm like, because we're not playing the shit that's on the radio. Like, I don't want to play this fucking trumpet, nur, 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 like walking shit. I want to fucking make beats like Timbaland. That's what I want to do. Like, mm -hmm. I don't do this. And so it's just so much stuff that goes on in, inside of schools, man. It's just such a toxic place. So toxic. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I Heron is like a liberal arts education. So like I took Latin in high school. I didn't take Spanish or French or anything like that. I took Latin, <laughs> a dead language. And like, we had like, like, yeah, it was just, I feel like it didn't really prepare me for the real world in a way, socially in a way it just prepared me for the real world. But education wise, like I couldn't balance a damn checkbook <laughs> until yeah. college because I didn't know that like, oh, some people have, have to pay bills with checks sometimes. Yeah. Like it didn't prepare me for any real thing that I was going to experience. So when you were going through all this basically teenage stuff, especially teenage girl stuff, did you have a support system where you talking to your parents? Did you have any friends that you could talk to or were you dealing with this on your own? So I definitely um, got lucky. I made friends in high school <laughs> after not really having any. Um, my family has always been there for me. Um, you know, even, you know, every family has ups and downs, but like, you know, I can always say like my parents are there when they needed to be there. Um, but I'm ty the type to suffer alone a lot of times. Like, so um, I'm glad that I went through those things when I was starting to learn how to create relationships because it told me that I didn't have to rely on myself so much. So why do you think that you, why do you want to suffer alone? Like what makes you gravitate towards that? Um, you know, part of it is I don't want to bother people with my problems, which is, which is a, I feel like a very common feeling. Um, but I don't know. I just, um, a lot of, I just, I've always kind of relied on me. Um, but I definitely, as I've gotten older, like, I know that like um, people are going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. um, people don't always have a hidden agenda. Um, things like that. When's your birthday? Uh, May 31st. I don't know what that is. I'm a Gemini. <laughs> oh, you oh, so you like on the border of a Gemini. I think I think I like it's like a, uh, it's like close to something else. But I do know. Gemini. Yeah. I don't really know much about that stuff. As you were talking, I was like, yo, she sounds like a Gemini, but I, I, I didn't want to assume because my daughter's a Gemini. She's 11 months, but shit you're saying she does now. And then one of my best friends, like, like, like he's a Gemini, so I can, yeah, that makes sense. Y'all, yeah, y'all be having secret lives and shit, too. Yeah, <laughs> secret lives. 
secret life. You just I said, about that. You you just said that you keep stuff to yourself. So you can be all happy around your friends and your family. And then one day a bombshell might drop. Like, damn, where'd that come from? Because you've been dealing with it by yourself for a year. It's like a secret life. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, yeah, whatever, nigga. Uh, but okay, so you were in high school, Heron. So now you hooping. Um like, so what was your athletic career? Were you on varsity early or how, how did it work out? I did JV and varsity my freshman and sophomore year. So I was a 50-50 player, down 50 play, up 50 play um, for my freshman and sophomore year. Then my junior and senior year, I was on the varsity team. Okay. And did um, you play AAU too? No, I didn't. So, um, I didn't really know much about that stuff. Like nobody else, like everybody else had played football and my sister was a dancer. So like we didn't really have an idea and nobody in the program could really point us in a direction. That's yeah. nobody's fault. I'm sure I could have figured that out myself, but I was just in the gym with my dad <laughs> lifting and I was out on my court playing basketball every day. Um, but yeah, I stuck with um, high school, just high school basketball. And then I also played softball. My oh junior and no my sophomore and junior year and was there a moment in high school where you were like okay i want to play sports in college or i don't or i'm going to do something else like was there anything that happened that made you think about the future so i always wanted to play basketball as long as i possibly could play basketball um the issue was one my size two i feel like i still didn't train as hard as i could have i mean like i know i mean now for my children if they want to play ball they gonna play ball they don't go all the way. You know, I know the people now, I know the programs they need to be in. I know the camps. I know, I know all that stuff now, but I didn't really then. And I feel like if I would have, I probably could have gone somewhere and played. Um, but I really shot my chances my senior year um, because I dislocated my shoulder oh, during wow. my season. Yeah. And then I try to come back early and I still am dealing with nerve damage now. So, <laughs> damn. So, so then that happens that uh, it's kind of similar to me too. Like, Cause after I left, cause I didn't play in North Central. I played at West Lane. I didn't, I didn't play in North Central. I got cut and then I didn't work hard enough. Um, like I love basketball, but I didn't at that time when you're 14, 15, you don't realize how dedicated that you have to be. Like if you want to be good in sports at that age, you have to dedicate yourself like a 28, 29 year old does to any other career, like at mm -hmm. that time, because that's your time. Um, and I didn't do that. And so once I got out of IU, I started coaching. I coached college basketball, I worked in the NBA, I did all that stuff. And like you just said, I'm like, man, like there's just so many things that I know now. So many people that I know now are like me, like, like if my daughter ever wants to play, like, like you just said, like I talked to my girl about this. I'm like, she's like, well, I want her to play. I'm like, listen, if, if she plays, this is not going to be a fucking game. Ain't going to be none of this like itty patty bullshit. OK, like we're going to be getting after it because I'm not if you're going to be on that court, we're going to be fucking good. If not, we can do something else. And it's just amazing, like how you're like, man, I wish somebody would have been on my ass, but <laughs> everything happens for a reason. You know what I mean? I mean, I would, I would, you know, I would go lift a couple of times a week. I wasn't going five times, you know, like I yeah. wasn't doing anything. I wasn't, I definitely was not eating like I was supposed to. I, I don't think any high school kid does. But when you're petite, like you got to eat them calories. And I was just eating whatever I felt like. And yeah, but it definitely, you know, I'm grateful because I realized my love for coaching um because i didn't play but uh, there is so many times that i wish like i could go back so i could go play again i miss it all the time so you're seeing here so you dislocate your shoulder so now you're thinking about post high school so what's what's this process like so what are you thinking about um at the time i wanted to be a math teacher a high yeah. school math teacher yes and every time i tell someone they're like what the heck like especially knowing me like just being a teacher is all you wanted and um i was i was content with that um i thought that you know i was just gonna go to IPY, get an education degree and um you know teach and then coach basketball whatever school i was gonna be at you, that's not that all that happened <laughs> you didn't want to go to iu or like purdue or nothing like that so i went to IPY because um one, uh, my parents weren't comfortable for me to go to a uh, campus school yet. Okay. Um, just because I have a hard time in school. So I have learning disabilities. Um, I have ADD and ADHD. 
in severe test anxiety and a mild case of dyslexia. Okay. Very mild. Not like I like, you know, I can, you know, handle well. So um, I had like a lot of accommodations and stuff in school and they just felt like it'd be better if I was home. And I was more than welcome to transfer whenever I wanted. They, you know, they definitely told me if that's really what I wanted to do, but I wanted to be home. Um, so I decided to stay home and um, go there. That's such a good decision. <laughs> I went to IU. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't have like any sort of accommodations that I needed, but I probably should have like tried to milk that shit be because like, yo, I don't care who you are. I don't care how you were raised. When you walk into a math class, finite math, your freshman year, and there's 300 people in there, and you're the only black face or the only brown face, or I don't give a fuck who you are. That shit is going to make you think twice about should you be there. And like, this is math, right? This ain't English. It's not a lecture. Like, they're doing problems on the board. People are asking mm. questions. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, how am I going to make this happen? And then when you take tests in them big ass class too, I don't know why, but I'm starting to get hot because I feel like every time we took a test, the goddamn heat was on, no matter what the temperature was. And it's just like, like they're they're telling you, you get caught cheating, you're getting kicked out of school forever. It's like, man, god damn. So that was a that was a really good decision for you to stay at home and do the IPY thing. Yeah, and I actually ended up I didn't even finish college. I haven't finished college yet. And I um yeah, I college it wasn't necessarily for me. Um, I think in the future, I definitely want to go back and get a either a general studies degree or get a degree in photography, why? just so why I you, have. Why do you? Why do you want to go back? Why? So, you know, as much as I don't need a degree, a degree is good to have under your belt. You never know what you're going to need. A general studies degree, just to say, I have the degree. You know, look, see, your mom went to college. That's I what mean, it I was, there it is. I was, I was 28 when I got it, but <laughs> damn it, I got the degree. At the same time, you know. I, I want to do all these great things with my photography. It would not hurt to have a degree in photography to be like, look, I, this is my portfolio. It's this big, but I also have this to go with yeah. it. So, you know, it's something that I debate about with myself a lot. I guess, the, I guess the credentials, once again, you talking to somebody who was like, fuck school. And I got a master's, <laughs> but, it's, but, but it's master's in education of all things. But it's just like, especially for like, Y'all age, right? Because like I said, I'm a geriatric millennial and I think you're on the back end of, of the millennials. Like when I was in college, Facebook came out. So we we were just on Facebook, just fucking clowning. Like like how Snapchat is now. That, that's how Facebook was. It's like, yo, we don't take this shit serious. And then Facebook has developed into the number one media company in the world where my entire business hinges off me running Facebook and Instagram ads. And so you got that, you got Uber, you got all these things that just have just popped off. It's just like, man, college didn't teach me any of that shit. You know what I mean? But what you said was key. You just want to be able to tell your kids, like, listen, your ass need to go to college. And look, I did. That's all it is. And I don't think I would tell my kids, like, you need to go to college. I would, I think at 18, you need to figure out what it is you're gonna do. And whether that be you go get a job somewhere, I don't care if you flipping patties or doing what, but I want you to be doing something. Yeah. You know, if it's one thing that my parents could say to say about me is that I work. Like, you know, I may not have finished school and I may not have done a lot of things, but they can they will be able to tell you nobody works as hard as me. Nobody. Nobody. And uh, that's all that I would want for my children is to, you know, work hard. Like you may not have all these amazing accomplishments that maybe someone else has, but you have your work. Where does where does that come from, that work ethic? It comes from my parents. Um, you know, like I said, my mom's not from America. She came to America, didn't know a lick of English. And like I said, my dad um, didn't have the easiest upbringing. Um, so, you know, he was homeless when he was a teenager. Damn. So, yeah. So, like, when I look at them, like, I can't settle, you know. They work so hard so that I could be as comfortable as possible. There's no, I have no excuse, you know, like, you know, they're going to help me as much as they can, but I'm going to do this so then I can, they can rest one day, you know, so they can relax. That's amazing. And so, so you are, are in college. You're like, you know what? I don't really want to do this shit. And so, so what's the what's the next step? Do you go to your dad like y'all to work for you? Like, or you know what? What was the conversation when you told your parents like, yo, I'm, I don't think I want to do college no more. <laughs> well, um, 
I actually, it was, so my whole college story is kind of the intro into me starting photography. Mm -hmm. So I was in school still and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I decided to start studying business and I had a boyfriend at the time and you know he was my high school sweetheart um dated him forever and you know he had just got a haircut okay i'm gonna give you some background so he just got a haircut he didn't like it we went and we took pictures with this like digital camera that i had whatever yeah and then people were like wow these are really great do you do this and i was like maybe <laughs> and so i was still in school when I realized I love photography, his friends started asking me, can you take my pictures? And then like strangers started asking me to take their pictures. And so I'm in school and I take one photography class. And at the end of that semester, I didn't do well in a couple of my classes. And I told my parents, I was like, look, I'm starting this photography thing and I'm just not doing good in school. It's depressing the hell out of me. Like I'm going to work, but I'm not going to keep going to school. And they weren't necessarily happy about it, but I think that they found some comfort knowing like she said she's going to work. So she's going to work. Um, and, you know, they still, you know, ask me every once in a while, are you going to go back to school? But um, I know that they're not hard pressed on it because they know like, you know, the, my work speaks for itself. So. So you went and you told them that you want to start a business and they were supportive, which. man, uh, At first. <laughs> they were it wasn't it wasn't a, it wasn't very smooth in the beginning my dad asked a lot of questions mm -hmm. he asked a lot of questions he's like what are you do like what is like he couldn't really understand and then i think once i started uh shooting at the studio and then definitely once i started shooting with the nba like now it's kind of clicking like yeah like okay. she can she can do this she's not just you know playing around like this is something serious how long did it take you from the time that you told your parents, like, I'm about to do this full time to start shooting with the Pacers? I uh, want is a little less than a year. So, oh, wow. yeah. So I start, I started working at the studio and I mean, at this, I'm still, you know, I'm still working for my dad. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I have multiple jobs. I have had multiple jobs since high school. So as soon as I worked at Panera, I worked at Panera and Michaels. And then I worked at Michaels and for my dad. Then I worked at, um, for my dad and worked at Kohl's. I always have had more than one job. I think the longest looking back on my, I was doing my resume, I think it was three months. I didn't have more than one job. Wow. So yeah, and it's by choice. Um, Cause I just, I can't sit still. And um, so yeah, I was working for him putting in the hours, I was shooting, doing whatever. And about January, so it was May, it was the end of the semester, that January um, I got linked is when I started, uh, got linked up with NBA Photos. How'd that happen? So I said that uh, my dad's job how I kind of got in with them, right? So yeah. when I was like, you like basketball, so why haven't you started taking pictures of basketball? And I was like, you're right. So I, so I'm at work, right? I'm working a Pacers game and I'm asking everybody, I'm like, who is the photographer that I need to talk to? Like, who do I need to talk to? And they pointed me to this guy named Ron Hoskins. He's like my mentor, most amazing guy that I know, appreciate him so much. So I go to him, like, I'm Pepper Robinson. It's really nice to meet you. You might know my dad. Of course he knew my dad. <laughs> he was like, I was like, I would really like to shadow you. I would really like to come to a game and I would just like to see what you do. I came to the game. I was on time, I was early, you know, I shadowed him and he's like, why don't you come back for the next game? I was like, for sure, any help that you need, I'm, I'm gonna be here. Same thing, I was there. And then the next game he was like, you know what? You should start doing this as much as you can. Every time that you're available, you know, you should come. And it just became a regular thing. Like I was gonna be at every game. I got my little pass now, like I'm, I'm here. And um, eventually, you know, I started shooting cause um, I was allowed to. And I'm, I'm I'm technically still his assistant. I work under him, but I have my own contract with the NBA. But I just, you know, I showed up every day. I was an assistant. I started from the bottom. I'm I'm still not assigned to a team, but I'm um I'm working my way up. You know, like I said, work is something that I hang my hat on. 
So, you know, um, yeah, I just, I kept bugging him. I kept trying to learn more. And every time I see him, I'm asking questions. What do you need help with this? Can I, what would help if I did this with my camera, et cetera. So yeah, if I, there's anything I could tell anybody, it's to put your name out there, find who you can learn from because there's somebody doing the job that you want to do. So ask them. That is such a amazing story for a myriad of, of, of reasons. Number one, like people are going to be like, well, her daddy got her in. Well, I mean, he opened the door, but like you walked up, like you asked around, sought the information, see who you need to, to speak to. And you walked up to them. And then the thing that you did, which a lot of people don't do, which I think a, like a lot of women don't do because they're kind of scared as well. But a lot of men, 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 too, is you gave him value. Right. You said, hey, I want to shadow you. I want to learn. I want to see what you do. And then you showed up on time and then you were good. And then that is the way that you got in. So many people hit us up or they want to wonder how they get in. This is how you get in. Like I told you, I, I coach. That's exactly how I got into coaching. That's exactly mm -hmm. like if you, you have to work for free. Yeah, you Everybody got to get over it. Yeah, exactly. This is the shit I be telling people. Like, if you think that you're going to be a fucking paid intern, you're going to work for somebody who doesn't give a shit about you. When you have an unpaid position, you kind of have leverage because at any given moment, you can be like, I'm out of here. And they're like, OK, but if you have built a brand or you have some sort of equity with them and, they, and you say that you're about to leave, they go, like, oh, whoa, 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 what, what, what can we do? You know what I mean? And so you have to work for free and you and you did that and now you have your own contract that's that's just such a so many people need to hear that that's amazing that you that you did that and you know i always want to go back to what you said um about how people can say that you know my dad handed me it and you know that's the way it's supposed to be for one he didn't hand me anything if there is one thing my dad has never done in my life is hand me a single thing okay a single thing Everything I have, I earned, but he definitely never let me falter. You know, he never let me fall. But that's what you're supposed to do for your child. You're supposed to do things so they, they, they can become the person that they want to be. Um, and I just got lucky that, you know, his company did the security for the place that I want to be at for as long as I possibly can be. And we all know somebody. We all know somebody who's in there. But like I said, once they open the door, you got to prove yourself. And that's, mm -hmm. it's just like me knowing entrepreneurship, me knowing basketball, me knowing coaching, me knowing putting yourself out there. I just know, like, I know that you summarize it, but I know that it's much bigger than that. And the amount of stuff that you had to do to put yourself in, in that position is nothing short of amazing. Nothing, nothing short of amazing. So that's, that's awesome. So then, so I, so now you're like, was there a game that you ever did by yourself without homeboy being there? No. So I haven't yet. Okay. Which is completely fine. I'm, you know, I'm still under him. You know, I still have my projects that, you know, the MBA will be like, hey, can you do this for me? I need this, this, and this done. Or he'll have projects or assignments. I think the coolest thing that I've done, well, I did like um, all the headshots, not all the headshots. I did uh, spe special headshots at Media Day for them. Yeah. Um, but I think the coolest thing I did is I took pictures of Banker's Life Arena um, for NBA 2K. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So I have special projects here and there. I shoot all pregame stuff, yada, yada, yada. Um, but like I said, I still work under him, which is fine. I'm still learning. Like it, it's, it's a big production. What people don't understand, it's not just sitting there with your camera. It's the light that you set up. It's, it's the internet that you have connected so they get the pictures right away. It's a very, it's a very tedious process. I still feel like there's some more I need to learn just because I, have the contract and they ask me to do things i'm still asking this man questions because he's been doing this almost as long as i've been born how many pictures do you take a night at a game a lot um anywhere from i want to say like 300 to 400 and it depends if i shoot during the game or if i'm just doing warm-ups okay okay and then you have to edit all those too no so um, for sports photography, I don't necessarily edit my photos. Um, I try to get it right um, because it's motion. Yeah. So nine times out of ten, I'm not editing a sports photo unless it's like like when Victor was hurt 
Um, yeah. I took a lot of pictures of him in his clothes and stuff. And I would edit those up a bit, maybe change the co colors and stuff like that. But nine times out of 10, no, I don't, I don't touch my sports photography. With, so you didn't really learn this in like school. And then the boyfriend who got the shitter haircut is how you got in. <laughs> the haircut was nice. We took the photos because the haircut was nice. <laughs> and we needed to build up that confidence. <laughs> So how did you learn all the technical skills that you needed to get to the point where the I forget homeboy's name saw that you had actual talent, and actual skills? Like, how'd you how'd you learn all that? First, I want to say a shout out to him because he he you know, he's he's a very pivotal person in my life. Yeah. I have to say, because um, like I said, you know, we grew up together. He's an amazing man. Um he definitely influenced me in a lot of ways. And I can definitely say, you know, my life has changed because of him. He definitely put me on the path to do what I want to do for the rest of my life. So big kudos to him, all love in that situation. Um, but I started, I started just shooting. Um, I think the one thing I always tell people who want to start photography is just to shoot, like shoot, whatever, shoot, whatever big idea it is, shoot in the studio, shoot outside, shoot, whatever. But I just started shooting. And then the first place I got noticed by with Erica at Through Her Lens, um, I work at her studio and she was the first person to be like, hey, do you do this? Like, I'm starting a studio. Would you like to join me? And I was like, yeah, I had never touched the studio until I met her. And she's taught me so much. I mean, from skin retouching to lighting and all of that. And um, so I learned a lot from her. And then. Um, with that, I started being surrounded by people who are doing the same thing that I was doing. And like I said, I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> I wanna know what kind of camera you're using? What kind of lens are you using? What do you do in Photoshop? Do you use Lightroom? Like all types of stuff. Yeah, we got oh, a question a from Crystal Jackson. As you say that, what kind of lens do you shoot with? Um, I like the 7200 a lot. I have I have all Canon. I shoot with a Canon 1DX. Um, but yeah, 7200. That's my favorite. That's um, I, it's so, a long one. Okay, sorry to interrupt you in that thought. I just thought as 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 you were saying it, that was a really good yeah. question. But um, it's you. You have a lot of the skills that everybody needs for success. Like you sign me a lot. Where like you put yourself in these situations, then you ask a whole bunch of questions, and then you go study, and then you go get the information. Which like it sounds. It's, it's simple in the philosophy, but the execution is hard because people got to get out of their own way. And it sounds like with you, based off your upbringing and what you went through with athletics and with school, you have a level of humility combined with confidence, which allows you to say, hey, I don't know this. Can you help me? And then once you learn it, then you apply it and you just go gung ho, which you probably get that from your dad and from your from your grandparents. Um. So what I'll say is, having learning disability and there's something that i don't talk about very often and if you know me you would never be like oh like she really she really got that stuff unless like you're around me all the time but you learn from an early age you got to advocate for yourself you gotta you gotta ask like i don't know what i'm i cannot sit still help me sit still like and so i feel like that is really what has helped me because you know there's no reason you should be afraid to ask for help. There's none at all. And I'm very lucky that people wanted to help because there are definitely people though that I have tried to ask for help or I've tried to, oh, let's meet up, let's work together. And they're not trying to share. They're not trying to share, but I'm definitely lucky. Like my studio family, shout out to my studio family. I love you guys so much. Anytime I have, if I have a photo and I'm not sure about it, I send it to them and they let me know. Like it's all about who you surround yourself with and it's, all about being wi willing to not be the smartest person in the room sometimes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So we've been seeing a rise, man. I know I have. Um, obviously, Instagram is a great place to display photos. since what it is, how it started. But there's been and this. I have my feelings about it, but I'm not going to really just convey how I feel. Um, there's been this rise of a lot of people who are milking off the athletes and the stuff that they do. And now we're starting to see people who are, I'm trying not to shit on her, but it's going to be so obvious. People who are photographers who are getting a lot more notoriety than a normal person would good, get for like taking pictures. Do you, where do you see the future of sports photography going? And where do you see the future of your brand going? Like, what do you want to do next with it now that you kind of have an opportunity inside the NBA? Um, with sports photography, 
I'm not really sure where it's going. I feel like it's definitely expanding though. I feel like athletes want their own photographer. Yes. Like this, you know, um, they definitely want someone that they can have come to whatever they need that can shoot them, whether they're in their normal clothes with their family or do whatever. So I feel like that's actually, I feel like that's really cool. I, I love the idea of having those relationships and athletes having those relationships because those are very intimate things, you know? Um, but for the most part, I, I just see, I just see it getting bigger. I see it, you know, it might get a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I, don't, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for. There definitely be some misses. Um, it, everybody won't be great, but I, I know I feel like there's room for everybody. Yeah. Um, personally for myself, my goals is to be assigned to a team. I don't care where it is. You can send me to Milwaukee and I will be in the cold and be okay. Um, but I would love to be assigned to a team. And, um, I, I definitely would love to at one point have my own studio, um, to have my own home base wherever I land. And um, just to continue to shoot, I mean, you know, I grew up watching these guys and it's sometimes really insane, like being like so close to them. Yeah. But yeah, like that's, that's really, yeah. Working in sports, um, especially basketball, I learned very early. <laughs> it's a very male dominated industry, very sexist. Uh, and there's aspects of it, not so much in the NBA. The NBA does a pretty good job, but other, but college, oh my God, so racist what challenges have you faced being a woman a woman of of color in that arena like are, is there anything that you've had to overcome or stuff that you face on a daily basis or do people assume you don't know shit or she's only here because of her daddy like what challenges have you had to face um well no one would ever say that to my face <laughs> that's for sure no one def no one's ever really had the gut to say that to my face and i'm sure they understand why um i am my father's daughter um i would say part of it is being comfortable like you know you're more comfortable when you're around your people right you know what i'm saying like and when you're in a room then you kind of the only female there sometimes yeah. you know it's you know, there's definitely other women there i'm not always you know i can't eat i would say for the most part i'm not the only woman there um but you know, sometimes, you know, like the ushers that I know that I see that, you know, how people get to their seats and stuff, like, oh, you're just so beautiful and stuff. And that's not, that's fine. Like, I don't mind getting compliments, but I never want how I may look or the fact that I'm a woman to get in the way of my work. Yes. Um, so far it hasn't. Um, I really had, I haven't really had many problems, but of course, you know, people, people stare. <laughs> People make you feel. Oh, did you did you did you see did you see did you see that guy over there? You see him? He was looking at you like, okay. I look. I get looked at when I go to the mall. Like, um, but for the most part, you know, nobody's really stepped to me. Okay. Um, and I'm very lucky for that. Um, it would be handled if someone stepped to me. Um, that's for sure. I I think I think part of that is because I give off that energy. Um, not to say that women ask for it, and not to say that um women deserve any of that is that uh i try to walk in somewhere and let them know like i'm business yes. this is what i'm here to do yep. you know i got my camera i'm taking pictures hi how are you um get back to work you know what i'm saying i'm never like hoo, 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 hoo. you're like hi no it's like hey guys how are you nice to see you i'm working you know um and i feel like that's important that's something that i would want other women to know you know walk with your head high you know, no one's going to test you if you, you know, if you looking like you can't be tested. You sound like some, you don't sound like Northeast Indianapolis right now. You sound like Hallville or Brightwood, Indianapolis. Right? <laughs> you know, uh, it comes and goes, you know, sometimes <laughs> when I get real passionate, um, you know, I went to Heron. <laughs> I, I didn't go to like Fishers. <laughs> Now I'm talking about Hallville niggas and my and my Brightwood niggas, but that's 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 really good, man. It's like it's it's just amazing, especially for me to hear like a woman 
who is just so confident in herself and who understands professionalism in a field where it easily can get derailed with whatever. You know what I mean? It's, it's all right there. And the women that I've met that worked in sports, whether it was sports journalism, whether it was sports photography, whether it was coaches or trainers, all of y'all had that same mentality. And that's why the success comes. And you're going to definitely, definitely continue to, to be successful. For anybody who wants to become a photographer in the NBA or be a, their own professional photographer where they can get consistent business. What are maybe like one or two things that you wish somebody would have told you when you first started that you want to tell them right now? The money ain't going to come right away. And the second thing I would tell them is that what you think is good when you start is not what's going to be good once you in it. <laughs> it, it takes some time, you know, I look at photos that I took and before and I'm like, whoa, like, whoa, I thought I could edit skin. Definitely could not. Definitely looks like a blur. Definitely, um, uh, definitely was not, definitely was not good. But like I said, you got to keep shooting. You got to keep putting out work and you got to keep practicing. It is like any other skill or trait or anything. It is almost just like basketball. You got to train. You got to do the things that you may not see the reward right away, but you will in the end. It will all pay off. I mean, I'm still not where I want to be. I'm still not as amazing as I could be. And I know that. So I'm going to keep working towards that. Awesome. So if anybody wants to take photos with you, do you still do private shoots? Do you have to be Indianapolis? Do you travel? Like where, where can they reach you? I'm down for everything. I'm down for everything and anything. Don't I say still- that because niggas will show up like, hey, uh, you can come out to LA man, this weekend, baby. I got you. <laughs> um, I like I will travel. Um, I shoot sports port- and portraits. So I will do anything like a fashion shoot, just editorial. But I will also do your family. I will also um, doing a senior special for seniors who are graduating this year. The pandemic hit and people aren't graduating. So I said, I'm gonna cut my prices in half. You can have whatever you would like, um, within reason. <laughs> um, but yeah, my Instagram, I take DMs. My website has a, um, the the website is in my Instagram bio. I can't, I could not tell you that um, right off the bat, but um, yeah, you can reach me through any of those. My email's in there as well. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you know, I'm, guess I'm down to shoot. <laughs> okay. Cool, perfect. Well, I want to thank you, and I want to tell you that I'm that I'm proud of you. I know me, you, me, and you. We haven't met in person, um, and I can tell by your personality and how receptive you were to me reaching out to you. And I can tell why, because me and you are very similar in a, a, a lot of things. Um, just what you've done and what you've accomplished is nothing short of amazing, and things are going to continue to work out for you because you have that mentality. That, that go-getter mentality. You have a gift of discernment. You're able to tell like the real from the fake, which I think is more of an Indianapolis thing, but I'm biased. But like <laughs> you are going to continue to have success and there's any way, and I'm going to tell you this off air too, like there's any way that we can help you, Group A2 can help you, I can help you with anything, let me know. Because seriously, like you, you're going to be really successful in this because you have the mentality that works specifically for sports and in life too. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cool. So that was Pepper Robinson, photographer. Y'all go hit her up. Her Instagram scrolling at the bottom. We out the pond. Y'all stay true.